Do you do me a favor before I get started? I want you to look at your neighbor, slap him a high five. Uh, there we go. Slap your other neighbor a high five. Then just slap somebody. I mean, no, I'm just joking. <laughs> We're going to learn today, right? Yeah. We're going to learn today, right? Yeah. We're going to leave here stronger than we came in. Yeah. Oh, how to say it. We're going to leave here stronger than we came in. Yeah. We're going to get new revelations that's going to help our life, change our life. <laughs> See, always remember this. God will meet you at your level of expectation. So today, that's why I... I Literally, I have to control. Thank you, Daniel. I'm sorry. I have to watch how I'm thinking before I get up here. Because if I think that it's going to be the normal, same old, same old, and that's what happens when we go to church. We think we put in our time. And after all, I'm, by the way, I'm honored that we put in our time. But I'm going to be here for an hour. Well, I'm up here for, been here since seven something. And I'm here today on Cinco de Mayo. I know what you all are going to do in a little bit. Don't you look at me like that. Mm -hmm. I know what some, listen, it's Flying Pig Day and Cinco de Mayo. I'm just glad you came. But let's get our money's worth while we're here, right? Let's do our, get our money's worth. Now, today, I, before I start a new series next week, I'm going to do a one-off. If we could bring down this light right here, guys, it's that one that, that bothers me so much. We've got a baptism to do in just a little bit. But I want, yeah, that's awesome. Somebody's, are we... I don't know the count, but I think this year it's probably in the 40s that we baptized just this year alone. And, and I'm honored that you allow me to be part of your life with that. Today, I want to talk to you about American Idols. Notice how I did that. We tried to do a you know, spoof on the uh, logo, but <laughs> Preston said it violated copyright, and he's a holy roller. <laughs> he's a holy roller, so... We're going to talk about idols, idols. Now, if you read the Old Testament, it really talks about idols a lot. In the idols they described, it's, descri descri uh, it's described in Scripture, you know, things that you would think about if you looked at, remember the movie Indiana Jones, yeah. Harrison Ford? Marie, you just got a little too excited about that. Remember the temples? <laughs> Remember the idols they were carved? And, you know, great movie, great movie. So, yeah, that's one type of idol. And if you think the ancient world, they did that a lot. But human behavior is human behavior is human behavior. The Bible tells me there's nothing new under the sun. Now, we may, nowadays, most of us anyway, we don't worship idols that we think are God of the supernatural but at the same time, we create idols every day of our life. And anything in your life can be an idol. Anything in your life can be an idol. We're going to talk about what God thinks of having something in front of him. And then we're going to talk about the disadvantage of having idols in your life. If you look at Proverbs, I'm going to go ahead and just throw the, uh, the living Bible up there, gentlemen. Are you ready? I'm going to read this to you, and when I point to you, I want you to read the word that I'm leaving out. Are you ready? Here we go. In everything you do, put God first. Oh, okay. Let's make sure we get there, because if we don't get this, none of this will make sense. And you may say, this is really simple, but I'm going to show you why it's so important. In everything you do, put God first. Second? 1.1? Almost first? Uh, first. And he will what? Direct you and crown your efforts with success. He will direct and crown success. So what is God speaking about? God understands that anything can be an idol. Your marriage can be an idol. Your car can be an idol. Uh, your job can be an idol. Your friendships can be an idol. Your children can be an idol. Anything that takes second to God, any areas of your life submitted second to God is an idol. Now, you may say, well, that's just not right. Well, I, I, I don't like the rules. You know, it's kind of like going down uh, uh, 275. You know, I don't like the rules of 65 miles an hour. I wish it was like 105 miles an hour. I don't like the rules, but the rules are the rules. 
now. So the bad part, I'll just be honest, the hard part is that we have to put God in front of everything. But the good part is, if you do, it opens up an entire world that you never dreamed of. Anything can be an idol. My marriage can be an idol. If I put my wife over top of my creator, she's an idol. Anything that's more important than what he says is an idol. Now watch this. And if it's an idol, it's your God. And if it's your God, it's what shapes you, motivates you, cultivates you, and transforms you in the wrong way. So he says, put first. So the other thing that I see here is that, uh, that if I'm not having success, more than likely, I've got something over top God. More than likely, I've got something over top God. There's nothing wrong with having things, right? As long as things don't have you. But see, here, here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Uh, people walk away from God because they don't like what represents God, and I don't blame them. For the longest time in our culture, we try to uh, mandate or uh, legislate morality. Do we not? Now, there are some things that God says you absolutely cannot do. No ands, ifs, or buts. We call those like the Ten Commandments, right? Like, let's see if we would. Then there are other things that the Bible just talks about, but doesn't say you can do that. You can't do them. But the last church, the church in the last couple hundred years, what we've done is we've become the moral police. You, you, uh, it's, this is going over like a lead balloon. We become the moral police, and we try to say things are not right to do. We'll call things sin that the Bible never talked about sin. For example, <laughs> stay. <laughs> All right, let's talk about the absolutes he says don't do. Don't kill. Amen. Two of you shouted. I'm concerned about the rest of you. <laughs> don't steal. Amen. Amen. All right, at least... 15%. Don't commit adultery. Got a little stronger on that one. Now I see what you all struggling with now. Never mind. <laughs> Don't bear false witness and lie on your brother or sister. Amen. Can I hear an amen on that? Amen. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. Don't talk about the pastor behind you. No, that's in the second book of Matthew. <laughs> so those are absolutes that we're not supposed to do. But then the last hundred years of the church, what we try to do is legislate morality. There are things that I was taught growing up that were a sin and would keep you out of heaven that God never said. Let me give you some of these things. Here we go. And it's okay if you disagree with me. It's okay. I always say if you don't disagree with me sometime, we're not a church family. We're a cult. Yeah, yeah. Right? Can I hear an amen? amen. You better. Come on. I have been wrong before. Don't follow me blindly. Don't follow anyone blindly. And if you leave a church because you disagree with something, honey, you're never going to find the perfect church. And if you find the perfect church, you're going to ruin it when you get there anyway. I need it. That was so good. I'm going, I, I need someone to clap or so I don't know. But here's things. Here's things. Here's things. Because I grew up where everything was a sin. Everything was a sin. I mean, it all was a sin. I, am, I think some of my family still think I'm going to hell. How about this one? Gambling. It's never listed in your Bible as not something not to do. I grew up, if you drank wine, you're going to hell. I want to let everybody know, I believe moderation. I, I can't believe I can't. I'm getting like stones right now. I mean, not throwing at me, but because standing up in Adams County, this would never go. Moderation of alcohol. It's acceptable in the Bible, but we've been taught it was wrong. I grew up that if you were a woman, you couldn't wear jewelry. My wife would be splitting hell wide open. I grew up that if you wore shorts, it was a sin. I don't believe shorts are a sin. I looked at some of your legs. They're ugly as sin, but it's not a sin. 
So we put in all these rules because after all, if we don't teach, if we, if we don't make people act like us and think like us, then, then, then we got to protect them from free choice. Because after all, if you say, now I want to tell you, so there are things that are in the Ten Commandments that are listed as sin. Don't kill, don't steal, don't commit adultery. Don't lie to get the upper hand. Then why do we submit and we put these other things that we think God messed up? Or he, Listen, if something was a sin and he would require something of you, if God's just, he would make it plain. And he's just. So why doesn't the Ten Commandments address all of these other things that we have tried to legislate as morality? Now, here's the difference. It's okay to have things as long as things don't have you. You you hear me? It's okay. Come to my house on my birthday you may not like what I'm going to drink. Can I? <laughs> However, if that consumes me, then we got another issue. Yeah. See, God didn't list a bunch of things that you can't do and can do. He did some, but like gambling. If it's your entertainment, have at it. If you're going to spend $50 at a movie or $50 at the casino, that's up to you. But when it starts to control you and have you, that's when it's a problem. Oh, Lord. This is going over. Everybody say idols. So how do I know that I have idols? Or something's more important. When something has me versus me having it, it's an idol. So God said, if in everything I do, If I put God first, I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments in just a second. He will what? Direct you and crown your efforts with? Do you know how I know that some people have former relationships and hurt and turmoil and and unforgiveness as idols? Do you know a lot of us, we we worship our forgiveness, unforgiveness, and we worship our bitterness. It's because you keep struggling with the same thing over and over and over. If you're struggling with something continually, it's because you're struggling putting God over top of that instead of that over top of God. Because when I put him first, if I'm struggling with something in my life, let's say I'm struggling with debt. Anybody ever struggle with that besides me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. Maybe you, you may, maybe maybe you haven't made dumb decisions because you you you, you have a ha, have an Amazon addiction. <laughs> the Amazon drivers at my house so much. I came home the other day. I said, "Are you sure?" I know what it's like to be worried if the repo man's... Anybody ever get to that point you see a tow truck and your heart just stops? You would rather see the devil in the flesh than that tow truck driver. (laughs) I know what it's like. And every time that I struggle financially in my life, it's because I haven't put him over top of my finances in my life. Because I'll make bad decisions. I'll buy things I shouldn't buy. I won't save. You know, Scripture is very plain about your finances. You're supposed to save up wealth not only just for yourself, but for generation to generation to generation. You're supposed to live generous. You're supposed to do all of these things. You're supposed to be a giver, not a taker. And any time that I struggle and I put my needs and my priorities over top of what God told me to, see, he will direct your path and it will bring success. God cannot violate his word. So he says, if you put me first, then I'll direct you. How? By the power of Holy Spirit giving you direction. Oh, I'm not strong enough to give up some of my addictions. I'm not strong enough to do this. I'm not strong enough to forgive. You're right. You're not. But we have the power of the Holy Spirit living, breathing inside of us. He guides us. He directs us. He empowers us. He shows us what to do, what not to do. And when we dismiss the voice of the Holy Spirit in our life and do what we want anyway, all of a sudden, what we're desiring has you instead of you having it. Can I hear an amen? Can can I hear an amen? Amen. So look at Exodus. Let's look at Exodus. We're going we're gonna to look, look at the t- part of the Ten Commandments. There, I'm going to ask you something, and I want to see if you get the answer right. How many commandments are there? Yeah. Actually, there's more than that, but in the Ten Commandments. We're talking about Moses. Then God spoke all of these words. 
Now, he's going to go through the first four commandments of the Ten Commandments. The beginning has everything to do with your relationship between you and God. The last have, it's about you and others. God's showing us something. If we get our relationship with God right, we don't have to worry about what we do right or wrong to others. So he spoke all these words. Verse 2. I am the Lord, your what? Okay, so he's going to declare this. And he's getting ready to tell you to do something. But before he tells you to do, he's going to do it, he's going to qualify and remind us how good he's been to us. Right? I, I, I love it when I know I'm going to have to ask a hard ask of my kids or a hard ask of my staff. I use that term very lightly. Or a hard ask uh, 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 of my wife, uh, whatever it may be. <laughs> And I'm afraid if I keep saying hard ask, I'm going to slip in a second. (laughs) That's good. It's like, baby, you remember I mowed the yard last week. (laughs) Baby, you remember I bought that Suburban for you. Who am I kidding? She's my sugar mama. I'm the splendid daddy. You remember how good I've been to you, baby. You, baby doll. You remember. And she always knows there's getting ready to be a hard ask. What God's saying, look at this. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So why would I ever want to put God first in my life? You all have been good to me. You're amazing friends. Sean, I've known you. You've been around here almost longer than anybody. God help us. I think about Sally. I, lo- I love Sally and Marie and Rob and Rob. And I go on. I love you all. And you've been good to me. Even my wife has been really good to me. But nobody has been good to me like God's been good to me. Amen. Nobody. When I was sick and afflicted, when I was getting ready to die in a helicopter, as I was being airlifted out of a car, it wasn't you that were there that brought my, my lungs back being inflated in my back. It wasn't you, it was him. Even though I love my friendships with every one of you, even though that I know you would try to do anything in the world for me, there's just a limit. But when I'm by myself, when I have no hope and there's no one to encourage me, it's the power of the Holy Spirit that encourages me. It's God that gave me a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth chance. It's God that's restored my life and lifted me up and turned it back around when everybody else walked out and gave up on me, which they should have. I didn't deserve anything, but it's God that kept empowering me and strengthening me that brought my life back together. It was the power of the Holy Spirit that gave me the power and the wisdom to do what I do. It was the blood of Jesus Christ, better off than anything, that washed my sins and made me as white as so, that put me on a pathway to heaven, and I'm sure for heaven as though I'm already there. He died for me. He rose again for me. That's a pretty amazing God. And he's getting ready to do a hard ask. And some of us wonder if I could ever, ever, ever do what he asked me to do. Why would I ever want to do it? When has he ever let you down? When has he ever not been faithful? Now, we may not understand things, but he's faithful. So he's saying, all right, I'm your God. Don't forget what I've done for you. I took care of you in the past. Now trust me what I need you to do in the future. I took care of you in the past. Now I need you to trust. See, submitting to the will of God and putting God first in your life does not mean that it's going to be easy. And sometimes we wonder if we can trust him. Sometimes we wonder how in the world, if I put him over top of my wife or I put him over top of my husband, I put my children, when I, when I learn to be generous instead of being gentle, how in the world am I going to make it? Because after all, I know better than God. Let me help you. You've already screwed up your life enough. Why don't you try something else? It's him that's been faithful. So he's saying, if I took care of you to this point, Trust me to do what I'm going to ask you to do next. See, the Holy Spirit's getting ready to put his finger on some people's lives, and I'm excited about it. And it's a very scary thing to live with reckless abandonment of trusting an invisible God that you've never seen but you experience every day. It's scary. 
But how do I know when you and I have to make the hard decisions to do right and put things right? And by the way, we all have areas that we have idols. Anybody that says they don't, you're a liar. <laughs> or no, you're deceived. That, I don't mean to be, look, I, I try to be a gentler pastor. But every time that we have to make the hard decision and we trust in God and we do what he asks, even though we fail miserably, I just keep lifting him over my debt, issues, and we've been through it. Every time I trust him because I remember where he brought me from. And if he took me here on me the first time, I need to trust him to take care of the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. Some of you are struggling right now. You're born again. You're saved. You love you some Jesus. You doing what you live in good. You, no one even knows what you're struggling with, but there's that area of your life that he's not first. And I'm here right now. I feel the power of the Holy Spirit. I need to remind you, he's taken care of you all the way up. My life hasn't been easy. You don't understand, Matt. You don't know the way I grew up. You don't know what's been done to me. You don't know who abused me. You don't know who violated me. You don't know what's been taken from me. I promise you, you're right. I don't know. But in spite of everything you've been through, the God that created you and designed you has got you through what you've been through. So why wouldn't you've trusted man? You've trusted everything else. Maybe one time, let's trust in the power of God and his wisdom and stop living for other idols. Verse 3. I got to hurry. You shall have no other gods or that's why I like the Amplified. It defines it a little bit more. Let's look at it. We shall go on back there. You have a problem with this one too there, Mr. Andrew. I'm just messing. <laughs> that's what happens when they hit that button too quick. They're going, move on, preacher. <laughs> I can't have any other gods. Is that capital G or lower G? It's a lower G. It's a lower G. I, no other gods before me or equal to me. So how do I know that something has me more than I have it? Let me read the rest of it. Verse 4. You shall not make yourself any graven image to worship it. Notice, it's nothing wrong with having something. It's what you have and what you do with it. What you have and what will you do with it? Nothing wrong. Listen, I, first service, we have a bunch of Harley riders. I mean, uh, Joe Hackett, God bless him. He's got 10 Harleys. I, he said, you think that's a sin? I said, no, having 10 is not a sin, but not giving the pastor one, maybe. <laughs> Nothing wrong with having a Harley Davidson. Nothing wrong. You come to my house, my wife has a swimming pool. I refuse to clean. <laughs> nothing wrong with having homes. Nothing wrong with having relationships. Nothing wrong with having a party. Nothing wrong with having a good time. Nothing wrong, nothing wrong, nothing wrong. But the question is, what do you do with it? Is it the thing that you worship? Is it on equal or higher than God? Nothing wrong with having... I would love, no, I wouldn't. I'd rather have my truck than a Ferrari any day. I'm a redneck yuppie and I'm proud. <laughs> nothing wrong with having vacations. Nothing wrong with having 401ks. Nothing, having, nothing wrong with having a million dollars. The Bible says the, the root of evil is the love of money. It never said the money. People need to stop quoting that, misquoting that, by the way. And, and, and if it was evil, then if money was evil, why can we give it and see people saved? It's the love of money. It's what you do with what you have. When it controls you, you worship it. You know why some of you will never... Oh, Daniel, get my car ready. <laughs> Park it out back, right, right there. Security, get ready. Do you know why there are people that have been with the same person 
for years and they're miserable. Every time you, they abuse you, they beat you, but you can't give that guy up or that woman up. You know why? Because you don't think you can make it without him. And that becomes your idol. Some of y'all's relationships are your idols. But here's the thing. When I make something my idol and I worship it more than worshiping the God that gave me that. By the way, I'll tell you right now, I want to let everybody know it's political season. Yay. I love my country. You hear me? I think about my grandfather that fought in World War II. I think about my uncles that Vietnam, I, I think about World War I and the price that was paid. I'm proud to be an American. However, we have really crossed the line. Instead of worshiping the God that gave us America, we're beginning to worship America more than the God. And I want to make sure everybody understands something. Jesus was not white, and he did not come from the Western world. And yes, God blessed this country, but if we don't wake up and turn our, oh God, turn our faces back to the God that gave us America instead of worshiping everything that we think, that's when we try to legislate morality. That's when we try to make everybody look like us, act like us, and talk, with, talk like us. And I'm telling you, just like me being married is a good thing. Someone said, why would that be a good thing? You don't want Matt Young single. I almost starved my kids. This is amazing. But if I would start to hear her voice over top of God's voice, God help me, my life will be destroyed. Anytime that I worship something that God gave me more than I worship him, that becomes an idol. Let me show you this. I got to hurry. You should not make yourself, didn't say you couldn't have it. Go verse, give me verse five. You shall not bow down yourself to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a what? Okay, okay. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the and those who now that sounds bad first of all understand that God's a jealous God all right now when I met my wife we set some ground rules after she stalked me <laughs> and I woke up one day and I was in a committed relationship and didn't know it. She just eliminated all the competition. She was with me every single day of my life. I just didn't have another time to date anybody else. That's how. But I looked at her and I, I know some of her past insecurities. I looked at her and I said, I know you going to have a problem with jealousy, but jealousy is not going to control this relationship. You with me? I said, in my line of work, I'm around a lot of the opposite sex. In my line of work, I talk to a lot of people. I can't live miserable. I said, I don't do that. She said, yep, you better not. <laughs> but then I looked at her and I said, let's lay some ground rules. I said, I, I, I need to benefit from this relationship, so I'm going to lay some ground rules. You lay some ground rules. And the ground rules were this. I will mess up, not like that, but you will always be first. Other than God, you're first. Even though I might mess up once in a while, you are going to drive the best car. That's very evident. <laughs> you, I'm going to take care of. You're first because I'm making you first. I need you to trust me. And we've been together eight years. And I've tried 
almost always <laughs> to make her first. So therefore, she lets me do what I need to do. When you make God first and he sees that he can trust you with finances, with cars, with relationships, having a good time. The whole Bible's full of a bunch of partying people. Jesus showed up his first miracle. He turned the water into wine and gave it to a bunch of nine o'clock party freaks. <laughs> but what was it? God laid down. Now he went on and said, don't kill, don't steal, don't covet, do all of these things. Don't do those things. Don't, 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 don't. But he never mentioned anything that we try to legislate as morality, even in our church, because after all, people can't be trusted their own devices because they don't know God as much as I do. That's the way we act. But he says, I'm a jealous God. Make me number one. And if I know that you value me and what I'm asking you to do more than those other things, I'll let you enjoy life. Anything. So, I know this woman's jealous. Everybody says, well, man, you've got a great, you know, she lets you go wherever, we'll do whatever. Let me tell you why. You know what I bought her for Valentine's Day two years ago? An AR-15. <laughs> <laughs> that was the dumbest move I ever made. I know, watch me, I value what we have more than what anyone else could be in my life. She's first. And because she's first, and I understand how sensitive she is, the thought of hurting her by putting something else more important than her, I can't do it. When you learn who God is in your life, because after you, it's one thing to be saved. It's one thing to go to church. But when you fall completely in love with Jesus Christ, even when you want to do some things, and you're never going to be perfect, even when you want not my will, but thine be done. Amen. Can I hear a good amen? amen? I've got four minutes, and I'm going to read you ten verses in Jeremiah. And I'm going to give you four. I'm not going to go teach four, but I'm going to just say them real quick. And we're going to baptize people. We're going to give you four disadvantages of doing it your way. You ready? Hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, O Israel. This is what the Lord says. Do not act like other nations. Nations there, you can't, it's not like France, Russia, whatever. We're talking different cultures who tried to read their futures in the stars. I'm not even going to talk about that right now. Do not be afraid of the predictions, even though other nations are terrified them. Listen, I want to pause. If you watch the news right now, you'll stop being generous and you'll start being stingy because they're saying you'll never make it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't be afraid. You don't be afraid. Don't be afraid Amen. by others' predictions. Yeah. Do not act like it. Verse 3. Their ways are futile and foolish. They cut down a tree and a craftsman carves an idol. They decorate it, oh, it sounds like a lot of things we do, with gold and silver, then fasten it securely with a hammer and nails so it won't fall over. By the way, if something's your idol, you're going to spend your whole life propping it up. And you'll be, can I hear an amen? amen. If you're with the wrong person in a relationship, and they, you are always going to be propping it up. If you have to make someone be with you, get some self-worth. If you have to convince them, Get some self-worth. There we go. Their gods are like helpless scarecrows in a cucumber field. They cannot speak, and they need not to be carried because they cannot walk. They need to be carried because they cannot walk. Do not be afraid of such gods. Man, don't be afraid of losing them, for they can neither harm you nor do you any good. Verse 6, I'm going to go quick. Lord, there is no one like you. And he goes on, why would I want to give up? There is no one like you, God. You're great. Your name is full of power. Who would not fear you, O king of nations? That title belongs to you alone. Among all the other wise people of the earth, in all the kingdoms of the world, there is no one like you. 
people worship idols are stupid and foolish. That's why I chose that version. I wanted to say stupid in church. <laughs> the things they worship are made of wood. They bring beaten sheets of silver. Mm. Then they dress these gods in royal blue and purple robes made by their expert trailer, tailors. But the Lord is the only true God. He is the living God and the everlasting king. The whole earth trembles at his anger. The nations not, cannot stand up to his wrath. It's beautiful. There are four things I learned from that, and I was going to teach them all, but I'm not, I don't have time. Number one, my idol will disappoint me. Number two, my idol will dominate and control me. If you don't believe that, just ask an alcoholic what it cost him. Number three, an idol will distract me. I know all about that one. Then number four, an idol will deform me. If you look at the 115th Psalm, they who make idols are what? So are all whose trust in and lean on them. Whatever your idol is, that's what your life will look like. It will deform you and stop you from being God's fulfillment and purpose in your life. I hope you got something. Now, don't go out of here and say, Matt Young said, I can do anything I want. I want to point something out. I only have enough bail money in a safe for me and Daniel. <laughs> I'm not saying you have a license to sin. But anything keeping you back from God's best in your life is a sin. I'm not saying you can do everything and anything with no consequences. I'm just saying, if you want true freedom, stop giving it more say than God's words say.